Hi, this is Paul. The number one people question people ask me when they get a chance to ask me a question about Jordan Peterson and the Bible is when Jordan Peterson talks about the meek and the Sermon on the Mount, is he right? So I've been thinking for a while I should do a video just on this, and this is that video. So this comes up in this comes up a number of times and places with Jordan Peterson, but this is from the biblical series nine, the call to Abraham. To the lowest place. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ishgol, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Well, so now we also know that Abram's a pretty brave guy, right? He gets word that this horrible war has broken out in the worst of all possible places, and that his nephew is involved, and the first thing he does is, you know, mount up his posse and get the hell in there and rescue his nephew. So Abraham's no, whatever goodness is from the Old Testament perspective, it isn't harmlessness, right? It isn't emasculation and castration. It's not that. It's not weakness. It's not the inability to fight. None of that is associated with virtue. And, and Peterson is very right here. Abraham in the Old Testament is a model of what it what it meant to be a man now abraham is not an idealized figure in the book of genesis abraham god has to work with abraham for 25 years and that's important in the conversation of 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 what a man is but but yet abraham peterson is dead on right here that abraham grabbing his sword to go save his nephew this is what a man does and the old testament and the New Testament, quite frankly, as we'll see a little, little bit, well, we'll have to get into that. It's unapologetic about this is, what, this is what a man is and this is what a man does. It's the sort of strength that enables someone to mount an armed team of 300 people when he finds out that his nephew is being kidnapped in a terrible war and to get the hell out there and take him back. And so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a call to, to, it's a call to power that, not, not, a kind of peaceful meekness. That's funny too, because you know. And this again, it's the stream of thought, which which I know a lot of us love. I love it too. You know, there's a line in the New Testament: "The meek shall inherit the earth." I got to look at my phone for a sec here. <laughs> I don't know what time it is. I forgot this part. There's a line in the part. New Testament that says, and it's in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, "The meek shall inherit the earth." And that I heard that line always bothered me. I thought, no way, that's not that, that's not right. Meek can't be the right word. So when I was doing the story of Noah and talking about the Sermon on the Mount, I spent a bunch of time looking at commentaries on that line, looking at the roots, the, you know, the Greek roots and the Hebrew roots, and trying to figure out what that meant. And it meek does not mean meek. That's wrong. Here's what it means. Those who have weapons and know how to use them, but still keep them sheathed, will inherit the earth. That's wrong. <laughs> now, th there's the thing. Jordan Peterson needs to... Get some new commentaries. You, there's been, if a, if you visited a psychologist and the last self-education he did was from sources a hundred years ago. Now, obviously, psychology has developed a lot more quickly in the last hundred years than, say, biblical studies. But biblical studies has progressed quite a bit in the last hundred years. We have far more texts. We have far better tools. We have all of that. So, so please. Um, please, Jordan, if, please, Dr. Peterson, uh, I'm glad you bought the, some books by N.T. Wright. You need to, I, I know you don't have time to do everything, but you need to get some newer commentaries. And it's, it's really hard to get into, just like if I, as a pastor, decide I'm going to wade into psychology. Um, you, need, you need people to help you because one of the things you learn as a psychologist, well, you develop yourself, so on and so forth. But anyway, you need some new sources because here, meek doesn't mean meek. Yes, it does, but you have to understand the context and how all of this works. Meek can't mean meek. No, meek does mean meek, but let's figure out what meek means. Now, one of the things I've been talking to some people who, who, who notice that um, a certain, the way Jordan Peterson approaches the Bible is is fairly well in keeping with this tradition that's uh, that's very strong actually in the Roman Catholic tradition of natural law. And in fact, 
And so here you have the picture of Thomas Aquinas, natural law. Well, what is natural law? Natural law is a philosophy asserting that certain rights are inherent, are inherent by virtue of human nature, endowed by nature, traditionally by God or transcendent source, and that these can be understood universally through human reason. As determined by nature, the law of nature is implied to be universal, um, existing independently of the positive law of a given state, political order, le um, legislature, or society at large. Historically, natural law refers to the use of reason to analyze human nature, to deduce binding rules of human behavior from nature's or God's creation with reality and mankind. It goes back to Aristotle, Cicero, some Catholic philosophers, Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas, um, during the Enlightenment, certain Enlightenment thinkers. So natural law has been around a long time. And natural law within Christianity is, is actually pretty hotly debated because there's a, there's a lot to talk about with respect to it. But if you think about, again, how Jordan Peterson finds the, um, finds the, why Jordan Peterson believes the Bible and how he connects it underneath to kind of this structure, you know, evolutionary structure that developed. And in my my Monday vlog, I talked a little bit about, you know, how, you know, how this how this is put together. So so natural law is is very close to Jordan Peterson and his project here. And I'm not again, natural law is a hotly debated thing within Christian within Christianity and among Christian philosophers and and also with respect to morality but but in a sense when you when you look at say uh jonathan Haidt or even sam harris one might argue that that even jonathan Haidt or sam harris who are both um both atheists in a sense they're also working kind of this this natural law domain so but there are there are long-standing interpretive patterns and one of, the, one of the interpretive patterns that we find is in the Roman Catholic Church, this idea of nature and grace. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And in the Reformed tradition, I'm going to talk, and if you've seen a bunch of my videos, you know this is a big thing for me. This is the structure of the Heidelberg Catechism, misery, deliverance, gratitude. Now, now nature and grace is a big deal in the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. And now when we get into the question of Abraham and masculinity and what it means to be a man that Abraham upon hearing that there's been a, a great war and his nephew has been taken captive he straps on a sword he gets his servants to take up arms and he marches out and if you've if you read the book of Genesis he wins he takes on these kingdoms now bear in mind at this time and place, a kingdom is not a very big thing a kingdom is probably one city and that one city, you know, might be smaller than one city block, and there might be 75 or 100 people living in that one city, but they have their own little king. And so Abraham, with, you know, 300 servants, is an incredibly wealthy man. And again, in the Old Testament frame, if you look at, say, Abraham, and you look at Job, and and um, there are various, there are various, how should we call them, uh, heroes, various models of what it meant in within that cultural framework to be a man now again there are we talk about archetypes a lot with jordan peterson there are models in almost every culture about what it means to be a man and these are these are cultural and but but again via jordan peterson he would say that these are evolutionary as well that this is built into us from below and and so abraham and peterson has this exactly right abraham is the model um, Abraham is, in the sense, in the Old Testament, the model man. He is hospitable. God has blessed him with wealth. And again, if you want to get a sense of this, read the book of Job. And so, but, but that, in the Roman Catholic schema, would be nature, natural law. And we're going to have to get into grace. Um, I, I had Luther on the previous version of this slide because Luther had law and gospel. And, and so Luther kind of... Luther changes the conversation a bit from the Roman Catholic uh, position, but remember Luther was an Augustinian monk, so you know he came by it honestly. But nature, grace. So, so a, the natural man might be like Abraham, but now we're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about grace. Now let's let's take another look at at what Peterson has to say about meek, because he'll, he'll go into this in the August. Uh, 2017 Patreon question and answer. 
And he goes into a little bit more detail and a little bit more background why he thinks this. It is that the meek shall inherit the earth, but I was looking up the multiple translations of the word meek, and meek is actually derived from a Greek word, of course, um, because the Bible, at least some of the original forms of the Bible were in Greek. Um, and that word didn't exactly mean meek. It meant something like uh, those who have weapons and the ability to use them but ser but determined to keep them sheathed will inherit the world. And that means that people who are capable of force, let's say, but decide not to use it are in the proper moral position. And Nietzsche commented on that a fair bit too, you know, he he um, thought of most moral morality as cowardice, not because morality itself was cowardice, but because most people who are cowards disguise their coward cowardice as morality, and they claim that their harmlessness, which is actually a consequence of their fear and inability to be harmful, say, or to be dangerous, is actually a sign of their moral integrity. Now, I, I think... I think Peterson and Nietzsche are correct on this. And one of, I think, the most powerful path chapters in 12 Rules for Life is, I believe, off the top of my head, chapter three, where it's three or four. But but it's basically where Peterson begins to deconstruct um, benevolence. And, and that hit me pretty hard, that chapter, because... And, and rightfully so. We, we ought to... There, do-gooding can have some really cheap thrills. You, you can really get your cheap thrills out of doing good. Now, this morning I got to my office and there was a homeless man right outside my door. Um, that's a long conversation. And those of you who've been my Facebook friends for a number of years know that this is a regular part of my life and my ministry at this church. And so I woke him up and we had a chat. And, you know, usually if I wake someone up, I want to, I want them, I ask, I invite them to use the bathroom because... Um, yeah, because when you wake up in the morning, you have to use the bathroom. And if you wake up a homeless person and you just send them on their way, you know, they're going to, nature calls and they got to do what they do. So I'd rather have them use the bathroom than the, the, the rest of the way that it goes here that I'm, that I'm more than fully aware of. So woke him up and used the bathroom. And this is the first time that he and I had met. And so chat a little bit and, um, you know, and, and basically try to show kindness, but you walk a fine line. And again, those of you who know, my past stories know all about those lines that you have to walk. But but Jordan Peterson's chapter three is really important because, okay, well, isn't this in isn't this nice of me to to be nice to this poor homeless man? Doesn't that give me status? Doesn't that make me feel good about myself? And and I often hear this used in in terms of, yeah, we should do good things to people because it makes us feel good. Well, in Christian terms, if you're doing it because it makes you feel good, well then, you know, in some sense. This isn't the exact, this isn't really what Jesus says, but you know, you, you're getting your reward. You've got your good feelings. And, and this goes all the way back to Plato and Plato's Republic. Um, the truly just are seen as unjust. And, and because Plato has this long conversation about righteousness, dikaiosune, and, and how righteousness works. And, and the truly righteous person is considered um, unrighteous by the rest. Because if the righteous person is considered righteous by his community, then he's already receiving the reward, and that reward is self-serving. I mean, Plato goes into this in, in, um, in his Republic. So, so I really appreciated that chapter in 12 Rules for Life, where, where Peterson you know, pretty ruthlessly deconstructs do-gooding and, and, and I think when Peterson does this, he's in, um, he's in good company with Jesus because Jesus deconstructs a lot of this and, and Jesus deconstructs it pretty, pretty brutally in the Sermon on the Mount and says, you know, if you're doing good so that you can be seen for doing good, then, well, you've already received your reward. Um, but if you do good in secret, then, then God will in fact, um, in fact, bless you. And so you should do good in secret. But now, okay, and in the Sermon on the Mount, now we're getting into the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to get into, again, how the Roman Catholics saw nature and grace. So the natural hero, all right, let's use those terms, the natural hero via, let's say, via Jordan Peterson's, by evolution, in evolutionary terms, the natural hero is like Abraham. Well, how does grace change that conversation? Well, Peterson has a little bit more to say here. And that's a really bad idea 
So, you know, if you're an axe murderer, but you don't have an axe, that doesn't mean that you're moral. So now with regards to, so that's the persona. And the persona is the mask that you wear. And that's what persona means, is the mask that you wear to convince yourself and the world that you're not a terrible monster. So, and and do-gooding uh, can, be, can be that mask. So that when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't have to run away screaming. You know, and you might think, well, that's a bit of an overstatement. But Jung was very interested in phenomena such as, um, say, psychological, the psychological phenomena that would characterize the actions of someone who might be an Auschwitz camp guard, for example. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty monstrous form of behavior. And the thing about Auschwitz camp guards is that there's no reason to assume, really, that they were much different than normal people. Now, there would have been exceptions, obviously, but, and what that means is that perhaps you too could be an Auschwitz camp guard and perhaps you would even derive some enjoyment out of it. And you might think not, but you shouldn't think not so quickly. And what and, and this is, you know, when I first started hearing Jordan Peterson watching his videos and heard him talk like this, I thought, this is a breath of fresh air because this, now we're getting into what I think is a Christian anthropology where where we're getting in touch again i should do a video on my own unique take on calvinism but this is this is a very calvinistic view of us it's very augustinian that um we are you know we we have this phrase there but for the grace of god go i and sometimes we speak it with respect to tragedy but we should also speak it with respect to malevolence that in fact um all of us have the seeds of of evil when that all of us have good and evil runs in all of our hearts and all of us have are capable of becoming monsters but as as peterson notes there's different ways to be monsters you can be the um you can you can be a feminine monster you can be a masculine monster we um you know we we tend to right now in our conversations about power and we're going to get a lot more into power in this video in our conversations about power we tend to we tend to look at monster and power and Peterson is right that that power is is not in and of itself evil because well for example we say if you're a theist you say you know God is or if you're a certain kind of theist you say God is omnipotent God is all-powerful so what that also implies is that if you could see what that meant when you looked in the mirror and looked at yourself you might run away screaming because you'd have a revelation of just exactly what the human being is capable of. And that's a very unpleasant revelation. And also one of the things that stops people from being enlightened, because that revelation of the evil of the self is part of the journey to enlightenment and an early part. Now the shadow would be all the parts of the personality that the persona rejects. And that might be the aggressive elements. Certainly the case, that's the case with, for people who are hyper agreeable. And, and I just heard that the, the shadow is the parts of the Per, uh, the, the parts of the personality that the persona rejects. So these are the parts of us that make us a hypocrite. The, these are the parts of us that make us a liar. And um, this is obviously from Jung. Um, and that's that's really helped to think in that term because a lot of times when I hear people talking Peterson stuff, they'll they'll use the shadow as synonymous with evil. But here you can hear Peterson say, no, that you have the persona, which is the front that you want to put up. And then you have the shadow, the part you're hiding, the part you're masking, the part you're keeping below. So I'm Pastor Paul. I'm very kind. I'm very patient. I'm very nice. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm all in control. But the persona, you don't want to know how impatient I get, how petty I get. You don't want to know the, the kinds of sins that lurk in my heart. And... Um, and what I do when I lose my temper and so on and so forth. So you have the persona and you have the shadow and, and he'll go into that a little bit in this video. And again, you can watch the video all you want. Now let, let's talk about meek because again, Peterson needs, <laughs> Peterson needs some better tools um, because I, I even tried to find this idea of meek and I couldn't find it, which, which means it's, here, here's the reality. If you look behind me, see, these are all commentaries behind me. Uh, these, these are just, a few commentaries people have been discussing and studying and commenting and arguing about the bible into for as long as the hebrews had the scriptures um this is what we do and i just in fact saw a 
a Jewish commenter this morning who was who was talking a little bit about that on YouTube in terms of Peterson and and yeah this is this is a long ongoing conversation but yet yeah, words have meaning and 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 they have what's called lexical ranges and and words can mean a variety of things and then when you do translation words continue to um, have ranges so is this exegesis is this exegesis right now exegesis is the study of interpretation of the bible so christians pastors do exegesis in preparation for their sermons and so let's talk about the word meek but we can't just talk about the word meek we have to we have to talk about it within the context of the sermon on the mount here because that's important um Nietzsche's observation about sanctified uh, flaccidity, and I think, um, is is exactly right. That that often we masquerade um, as noble because we're really just cowards. And as a pastor, you know, that's that's certainly something I see in myself. There'll, there'll be times when it, it's always difficult to know when it's when a hard word is appropriate and when a soft word is appropriate. And I think most pastors tend to have a bias to go one direction or the other. I know some pastors who they instinctively turn in for the hard word and some pastors instinctively turn in for the soft word. But but knowing exactly which one is right when, and I think clinical psychologists have this exact same struggle, knowing knowing which move to make, well that's the that's the game. That's that's the difficult decision. And so Nietzsche's right on that. And, and then the integration of, in order to get rid of, so you've got the persona and you've got the shadow, and, and Jung is right that you're going to have to integrate these. Now, this doesn't mean that a persona is evil. We all need to a certain degree, when I'm a pastor, when I'm at work, I take on a role. I need to do that. But I need to integrate these other aspects of my life, otherwise that dualism will rip me apart and actually the the dualism leaks out and and when I think again when we talk about when Peterson talks about lying pastors he's talking about pastors whose shadows have not been fully integrated into their personas and of course none of us are are fully integrated this is always a project that we're working on but you know this is what we're talking about so let's talk about the sermon on the mount now I'm going to use now again um I've got, for a long time, the Gospel of Matthew wasn't particularly well served with commentaries. In the last 20 years, there's been a lot of good ones, and this is one of my favorites, International Critical Commentary. Um, now, for those of you who are interested in commentaries, I almost never buy a set, because sets are always uneven, and so what you tend to want to do is is cherry pick. And if you're interested in finding lists of commentaries, I can point you to one of the places I look. But this is this is a particularly good one. It's it's not cheap, um, and this in fact is only um, Matthew one through seven, so that'll give you an idea how how um, how long the conversation is. So let's first talk about beatitudes because that's that's what this is. Um, that's where you'll find blessed are the meek. Blessed are is the formula. Beatitudes, makarois in Greek, makarois, you see the accents on the second syllable, is first found in the work of Pindar, uh, 522 or 518 BC. The word basically means, now, now here's a, again, here's a little insight into the complexity of studying the Bible. The Christian New Testament is written in Greek, and it's often called Koine Greek, which is kind of the common Greek of its day. But now, the that you're working off a translation and again if you watch um northrop fry he makes a good point of that, that that christianity often works off translations because the old testament uh the hebrew scriptures are mostly in hebrew and you've got some aramaic but then in the first century bc or whereabouts they were translated into greek and so many many gentile christians and the church that minister to the Gentile aspect of the early Christian community used the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So now when in the gut, but 
we have every reason to believe that Jesus, when he spoke the Sermon on the Mount, spoke it in Aramaic. And so whenever we study the New Testament and the Gospels, we've always got that kind of lurking in the back of our mind. And so when we're going to talk about these Beatitudes, we're going to look at them both in Greek to understand, well, how does their translation into the Greek language impact them? But we also have to understand it primarily within the interpretive framework of the Hebrew Scriptures. And it, when you get into church history and you get into you know, how the church dealt with these cultures, this relationship between Athens versus Jerusalem, Greek, the Greek mind and Greek philosophy versus the Hebrew scriptures. This is always a big deal. So first we're going to talk about Greek. And so there were, in fact, beatitudes um, in that were known within Greek culture. The word basically means free from daily cares and worries. You will find some translations that say happy are. And not happy in a shallow sense, but men, most English translations will say, blessed are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. Um, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. To be, I'm reading Dallas Willard's biography right now, and, you know, one of Dallas Willard, who was a phenomenologist, taught at USC, also was a, was a pretty... Um, a uh, powerful Christian writer. One of the things that, that Dallas Willard said, said that is that in philosophy, philosophy, the history of philosophy was always asking the question, what is good? What is the good? What is the greatest good? What does it mean to, to live a full human life? Now, again, we've talked about Abraham, and Abraham in the context of, of the Hebrew Scriptures is a model man. And, and so this is, this is what it meant to be a man. In, in that cultural context. So, blessed are, well, the word in Greek basically means free from daily care and worries, prosperous, and is used of the blessed state of the gods. And now the gods, again, in Greek are kind of these, these elevated humans. They're, they're kind of people writ large. So it frequently turns up in a formula, um, you know, makarois hos, or, maka, you know, happiness is, or, you know, Blessed are those who, um, um, blessed are, this is exactly what you'll find in the translations of the temple. Um, you find them in Euripides. But this is, but this is only one um, of many forms the Beatitude took on Greek soil. And then they go through some of the other, okay, among the other objects evoking the Beatitudes in Greek literature are praiseworthy children, virtue, piety, wisdom, and fame. Now, in accordance with probable Egyptian influence, and again, these are all debates that go on within Christian scholarship, um, the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament beatitude formulas appear first in wisdom literature and in literature influenced by wisdom in sentences praising wise men and holding him up as a model. Now, if you read the book of Proverbs, you'll notice that a lot of Proverbs are attributed to other things. It's helpful to understand wisdom literature in the Hebrew Scriptures. You have the law and the process, the prophets and the writings in the Hebrew Scriptures. And the writings are, are books that are, in a sense, that's their literature library. And wisdom literature is about general revelation. In, in a sense, it was... It's not really science, because you don't have the scientific method, but it's about observing and being wise and being skillful and being shrewd and being prosperous. And so if you read, for example, the book of Proverbs, you have all of these Proverbs, and the, the project of the book of Proverbs is that you'd give it to a, to a young man. Um, you know, women could read it too, but it was written for men. It was, it was basically teaching men how to grow up to become boys, how to grow up to be men. And if you follow the book of Proverbs, this is what you'll go. And now the, unlike other parts of the, you know, Moses and the prophets are addressing specifically Israel, writings are from the various neighbors also in the region, because the idea is that in a sense, Moses and the prophets are special revelation, but the writings are kind of general revelation-ish. This is what we can learn by paying attention to the world. And so that's, it's in that sense that the Beatitudes, these blessed are, 
Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are you who save your money. Blessed are you who eat right. Blessed are you who raise your children well. Blessed are you who get a good education. Blessed are you who are faithful to your spouse. Um, this is general revelation telling you if you do this, things will go well with you. So now we can already see a connection to natural law here. So this is in, this is in the Hebrew scriptures. Blessed, I, bless am I, blessed am I, for the women will call me blessed. This is Genesis 30. Um, Job, which is in the writings. Um, Behold, blessed is the man whom God uh, reproves. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor, sit, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 1, that's the opening of the book of Psalms. Blessed is he who lives with an intelligent wife, and he who has not made a slip of his tongue, and he who has not served a man inferior to himself. Ecclesiasticus, that's from the, um, the Apocrypha, the, um, the, the sliver of the Bible that you'll find in your Roman Catholic Bible, but you won't find in, in many Protestant Bibles. And Protestant reformers said, these are good books and profitable, but they're not part of the canon. So that's kind of the difference between, say, the Catholic Bible that might have the Apocrypha and the Protestant Bibles that often don't have them. But you can get that. You can get a sense from that one. And here's a list of other verses that have them. Blessed is the one who lives with an intelligent wife, and he who has not made a slip of the tongue. Yeah, who of that? Who of you know? Who of us hasn't made a slip of the tongue? And he who has not served a man inferior to himself. And this is if your boss is an idiot, woe is you. And so woes are kind of the opposite sides of beatitudes. Later, the beatitude begins to appear in eschatological context, particularly in apocalyptic writing. Now. In Christian theology, we talk about eschatology, which is last things. And so you have this narrative, you understand um, human history like a narrative, and so eschatology is telos, it's ends, it's um, where things are going to wind up. Now, apocalyptic literature developed in the Jewish communities after their hundreds of years of subjugation to enemy powers and and pagan powers and and the great empires and and it was this it was this genre that you see it's very symbolic so you can find it clearly in the book of daniel um especially in the last five chapters of the book of daniel where you have the sea and the monsters you know when jonathan peugeot did his treatment of Pacific Rim. I mean, he told me he was going to do that. I was kind of like, why are you going to do Pacific Rim? And then when I saw the treatment, I thought, oh, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. You have monsters coming up out of the Great Sea. This is the book of Daniel. And then you read the book of Revelation. Um, in fact, the book of Revelation is, is Revelation, English, Greek, um, um, apocalypse. And apocalypse means revelation. And even in our English language, we hear apocalyptic, and, and that's kind of translated some of that meaning has come into the English language. But Beatitudes come into effect in apocalyptic literature in terms of a reversal. In other words, you might say, blessed are you who saves your money. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't store up money on earth where, raw, where, where rust and moth consume. Well, there's some eschatological meaning, and there's, in a sense, a little bit of apocalyptic meaning, because as Jordan Peterson notes, uh, saving your money makes good sense if money is able to be saved and society has enough order that nobody's going to run in and take your money. All of these virtues that we have, like blessed are you who save your money, these are contextual. Now, if you've got a whole big chest of Confederate money and it's 1864 and the war's going bad, stupid are you who saves your Confederate money better start spending it. And that's why the value of Confederate money just evaporated. This is why when times are chaotic, people start investing in gold and the price of gold goes up because, hey, the U.S. dollar, there's just a report out about all the red ink that the government is... Um, you know, all the all the debt the U.S. government is taking on, at some point people are going to get nervous about that. And then, you know, what happens if the world abandons the dollar? Boy, you could see a slide fast. I don't want to get into politics or economics because I'm not a politician or an economist. But this is an illustration about 
eschatology and apocalypse. And, you know, you watch The Walking Dead and someone might have, you know, what's what's a value in The Walking Dead? Well, it's cans of food and it's guns. It isn't cash. You might as well burn that stuff. So Beatitudes appear in apocalyptic literature. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 3,333 days, Daniel 12. How blessed are those who love you. They will rejoice in your peace. Blessed are those who grieve over all your afflictions because they will rejoice for you upon seeing your glory and they will be glad forever. Blessed are you, righteous and elect one, for glorious is your portion. The blessed ones shall be in the light of the sun. And and so there's not, there, you know, Daniel, book of Revelation, there's a little bit of apocalyptic literature in the Bible. There's a whole lot more apocalyptic literature outside the Bible. And, and beatitudes come into that but but again it's often in a in a reversed form and it's in a form that says well it, we might think of it in terms of a dualism that say in this world these are the rules but when everything falls apart these are the rules and so your actions that will lead to blessings in one world are different from your actions that will lead to blessings in another world and then see also the eschatological macarism, it is important to observe, is usually addressed to people in dire straits, and the promise to them is of future consolation. So in contrast to the wisdom beatitude, where moral exhortation is, despite the declarative form, generally the object, assurance, and the proffered hope are the goal, eyes become focused on the future which will reverse natural values. Remember, we started talking about natural law, which will reverse natural values and the present situation. Fulfillment is no longer to be found in this world, but in a new world. The dismal status quo of those addressed is taken as a given for the present and only to be altered by the eschatological intervention of God. And this is where, this is where Jordan Peterson's God is important and and I think I think in some ways Jordan Peterson's God is a little thin and I don't mean that physically I mean in in terms of action in the world and this is you know this is this is why the conversation comes down to the resurrection again and again because these beatitude um, macarisms or these eschatological macarisms are you know they're Blessed are these people who have it really bad in this world because God is going to intervene on their behalf. That's at the heart of it. And I'm really excited for Peterson talks about the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not sure how right he's got the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most important passages in the New Testament. We get a lot of really important things from it. But what's interesting about the Sermon on the Mount is that when commentators, even from similar traditions, approach that text, they go different ways. And whenever you see that in theology, you know that something is really hard. We can't, we, we, we haven't really quite gotten our minds around the Sermon on the Mount. We haven't figured it out. There's lots of parts of the Bible. We got that figured out. We kind of know what it is. But you get to the Sermon on the Mount and it's like, Everybody gets all over the map on a lot of different things. And you get this often with the Beatitudes, too, that, that lead off the Sermon on the Mount. Um, during um, Turning to the New Testament, um, Makarois occur 50, uh, 50 times. 13 in Matthew, 15 in Luke, 2 in John, 2 in Acts, neither a Beatitude. 7 in the Pauline Corpus, only 3 of which are Beatitudes. 2 in James... Um, two in First Peter, seven in Revelation. Notice the um, now in Revelation they're going to be more the eschatological types. The word is often ex um, the word is used almost exclusively of religious joy. Now that's important. Um, the related noun um, makari. Um, now I've got to now I've got to speak a foreign language and a dead language at that. Um, makarismos appears three times. 
With regard to form and function, the New Testament macarisms exhibit diversity and display all the features therefore too noted in Jewish literature. Again, the frame of reference for reading the Christian New Testament are the Hebrew Scriptures. And when you uncouple those two books, as what happened in some ways in in I don't want to I don't want to pick a fight with certain elements of the church. When the church stopped reading the New Testament in the light of the old, things went badly. There are beatitudes belonging to um, sapiential tradition, Romans 14, beatitudes belong to eschatological tradition. There are isolated beatitudes, beatitudes in series. The New Testament also contains eschatological woes. So Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount. Luke has the Sermon on the Plain. Anybody who's read both of them can see, hmm, there's a connection here. Now, why is it important that it's on a mountain in Matthew? Well, we're going to get into that because Matthew is written to a to a Jewish audience, and Math the Gospel of Matthew spends a lot of time trying to orient its argument towards its audience, and it leverages their associations and loyalties with the past. So when Jesus goes up on a mountain, we're thinking symbolically of Moses going up on Sinai, and Jesus comes down with the new law, but Jesus, in a certain part of the Sermon on the Mount, tweaks the law and says, you have heard it said this, but I say this. And so now we're getting into a little bit of the Roman Catholic tradition, nature and grace in the Sermon on the Mount. One of the things that this author points out is that actually the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, and this is very common in the New Testament, are tracking Isaiah 61. Now, if you jump over to Luke and you look at Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth, Jesus preaches on Isaiah 61. And so, you know, Matthew and Luke are, in a sense, working the same thing here. So Matthew, Matthew begins, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah starts out, um, Isaiah 61, Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, to comfort all who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Ah, here we are. Now we're at to the meek. Um, praeos. Uh, praeis. Sorry, praeis. Um, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth to the uh, to preach good news to the poor. Now, when you see MT there, that means the Masoretic text. That means it's in Hebrew, and this is the um, this is the Anawim. Um, these are well, an Anawim is usually translated into Prais or Meek, which is translated in English. So here's the thing. The, if we want to understand what Jesus means by meek in Greek, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have to go back to, through the Septuagint, probably to the Masoretic text, and look at the relationship between the Hebrew and the Greek in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, because it's in this context that Jesus is using it in the New Testament. Now, the New, Jesus refers to the Old Testament almost constantly in his teaching. And it's important to pay very close attention to that because as we do with quotes today, sometime when you're using a bit of the Old Testament, you're drawing that whole context in and bringing it in. Sometimes when you're using it, you're contrasting it. And we do all these kinds of things with, with words today. And so if we want to understand what meek means in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, we have to understand how it's used in the Old Testament. Now, I will sometimes surprise people by saying, you know, the meek will inherit the earth is not, well, original to, so we've got biblical theology over here and we've got systematic theology over here. Um, Jesus is quoting Psalm 37 when he says the meek will inherit the earth. This is Psalm 37, at least the first part of it. And now it's a Psalm of David. Now, I'm not going to get into those little things, but, but for the sake of the readers, the... Um, whoever puts the psalm in here wants you to think of this in terms of David. And now again, when you think of the type of man that Abraham was, David was a bona fide hero. 
David, as a young man, takes on a giant while the giant of Israel, Saul, is cowering in his tent. Um, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. Is there anything meek about David? I would say yes. But now we're going to get into this question of meekness and what meekness means. And so when Peterson says, oh, this word means no, the way you're defining that word is wrong. Um, but you have to understand that word in terms of the far richer context where your main point is correct. And so I, when I was talking to the, uh, the Bay Area Jordan Peterson meetup group, I made the point that just because Peterson gets meek wrong in the Beatitude doesn't mean he doesn't have a point with his larger point. You might not get there from that passage, but I'm going to show how actually you can get there in another way. So um, th get rid of what you're saying about the meek, please, because you're wrong, and find some better ways, some better support, some better proof text, if you will, for your point in others. And that's, in a sense, what I'm doing with, with this little video. So Psalm 37. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon, soon die away. Now, if you're listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson, you might read that verse and say, wow, that's an evolutionary argument. That's a Darwinian argument. And you might even say, this is a natural law argument, because what it's saying is that, um, and we think about Jordan Peterson's definition of truth, your, your wickedness is short-lived. You're, you're doing something that may be profitable for the moment, but wisdom says over the longer period, it leads to evil. And, and now we're going to get into the question of, well, meekness. When is it time, when is it time to submit? When is it time to stand up and protest? It's not always time to protest. It's not always time to submit because it depends to whom you submit. Or against whom do you protest? And you have to figure out how these two motions work. And actually, the strong man, who is also the wise man, read Ecclesiastes 3, um, the strong man and the wise man knows when to fight, knows when to submit. This is what, this is what the truly great man knows. Um, someone who is always fighting doesn't know how to submit. They haven't integrated the shadow self. Um, someone who's always submitting doesn't know how to fight. Same thing. This is what it means to be uh, a fully functional human being. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now, why do you trust in the Lord for this? Well, because you can't always win. And sometimes the other guy has a bigger army. And so then you despair and says, good will not triumph. Well, trust in the Lord. Why? Because... The Lord finally holds outcomes, not you, little man. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Now pay attention here. These, this isn't automatic stuff. This doesn't say, and a lot of literalists, religious literalists, go here. Well, the psalm says this, so therefore it's this. They do the same thing with Proverbs. Psalms and Proverbs are in writing. Psalms are the Psalter, literally. Uh, this is the prayer book of the, of the, of the Israelite community. Um, it's also Christians regarded as inspired. It is exactly what it's supposed to be, and it's our guide, but these aren't rules. Okay, this and so in a sense, you have to understand natural law in terms of this is the way it goes. Does it always go this way? Well, now we're getting into a mechanistic view of the world, and none of this is mechanistic, which is why it re requires context and faith. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath, and do not fret, do not worry, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry. Well, he's, he's really riffing off Psalm 37. Do not worry, do not fret, it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord 
will inherit the land. Now pay attention there, because what the Hebrews do with poetry is they have these couplets. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked. He, For he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and the needy to slay those who are whose ways uh, to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will break. Now this is where we're getting into this Anawim tradition that has um, the the prey the praes. I should go back and learn how to say that Greek word because they always read it and you never say it. Um, this is the word behind meek that Jesus uses, and it's there in Psalm 37. And the context is, these are people that are being oppressed. These are people who, now remember, you've got, you've got Israel here, and to the northeast you've got um, the great empires of the Fertile Crescent, and to the southwest you've got Egypt. They're always getting dominated by one side or the other. And then later, it's the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then, you know, throughout human history, they never have a land. Uh, this kind of seeds Zionism in that whole movement. But they, they never have a land unless some powerful actor gives them, gives it to them. And so the British Empire gives Israel its state against the Palestinians. That launches this whole big mess we have today and and the american government backed on the left by i'm not going to get into politics but anyway so the point is israel was always somebody's possession and but even if israel even if the empires hadn't really gotten going the weak are always under the foot of the of the powerful and and what hope do the weak have well psalm 37 exhorts the weak to put their hope in the lord now now, this is where Peterson is walking an edge because he wants to say, don't be weak. Well, but there's a time when you got to play possum. And and the smart know when to fight and they know when to submit. And, and they figure out how to do that. And then wisdom says, figure out how to do that the right way. But now with God in the mix, remember these are theists, your ultimate, your ultimate hope comes not from your own power, but from God's ability to save you. So now, um, blessed are the meek, as we find there. Um, now compare that to Second Enoch. In, patient and, in patience and meekness, spend the number of your days so that you may inherit endless life. Again, this um, um, Second Enoch, I think, is 2nd um, is second century, second century BC. Very interesting book. Um, um, Prouse occurs only four times in the New Testament, three times in Matthew, and once in First Peter. And that First Peter is a very interesting is a very interesting reference. The praise of mildness and gentleness was known in both Greek and Jewish worlds. And again, you can see this in Plato, Lucian, um, Philo, Josephus. This is not an unusual thing. Um, Schweitzer's commentary of Matthew suggests. In Matthew, the powerless may be a better translation. Um, the price are not so much actively seeking to avoid hubris and attitude as they are, as a matter of fact, powerless in the eyes of the world. This is a condition. Now pay attention here. In both 11.29 and 21.5, Jesus himself is, like Moses before him, called meek. He bowed the neck of his soul and body. This made him in meekness in, as, in so much else the model. The Messiah's life gives content to his words. So Jesus is meek. Well, what do you mean by meek? It means he's powerless. Now, if you listen to some of my other sermons, you have to understand something of the context of Jesus' ministry and the culture war of his day. The... The Jewish community was looking for deliverance from Imperial Rome, and they responded to that deliverance, to that desire for deliverance in different ways. The Essenes go off into the desert, say the world is bad, 
You know, they build a bunker in the desert and they live there and they pray for God to nuke all the evil people. And then when God is done nuking them all, they'll come up out of their holes like, um, like prairie dogs and inherit the earth. That's the Essene strategy. The Zealots, well, they're the revolutionaries. They're looking to knife Romans. Okay. Now, the Pharisees are, are more kind of like the evangelicals. They're, they're practicing their culture war, and they're resisting uh, Roman corruption, Roman ways, Greek ways in, you know, Hellenism by, by keeping the law at home. But they're, you know, they're, they're just always, they're just always playing this game. They're not out in the desert praying. They're not knifing Romans, but they're, they're cursing Herod and the Romans, but their expression is one of individual piety a little ways away. Well, then in what sense is Jesus meek? Because Jesus doesn't back down to anyone except Jesus submits to the Father. Well, in what ways is he powerless? Well, Jesus can still a storm. Well, if you can still a storm, you can make a storm. If you read ancient stories, more, more naval battles seem to be won by storms than by the opposing navies, and, and these storms change the course of the earth. Well, why can't Jesus cause a storm and, and stop the Roman fleet? Why, if Jesus can raise the dead, it's far easier to kill someone than to bring someone back to life. If Jesus can raise the dead, he can certainly kill them. Why can't Jesus just kill a Roman army with a word? He's got power, but he doesn't use his power that way. And so now we're kind of getting into Peterson's, um, we're kind of getting into Peterson's definition. But again, it's a long way through it. And, and so meek here essentially means powerless. But Jesus and Moses, now Moses is the humblest man who ever lives. You'll find that in the, um, you'll find that in, in the Torah, in the law. Well, how are Jesus and Moses the same? Because remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes up to the mountain. Well, here's a little saying by Dallas Willard that you might find helpful. Somebody once asked him, you know, where do you find God? And Dallas Willard said, at the end of your rope. Well, what does that mean? Well, as many of you know, those of you who have become Christians, I hear from many of you, well, it was because, you know, you went into a 12-step program or because some tragedy befell you and, and you had no more resources of your own to fix your problem and to cope with it. If you look into my parenting through adulthood classes, the, one of the big points that I make is, is we are given the gospel to make us stronger in suffering. Now, that's opposite of, let's say, what prosperity gospel preachers preach. Prosperity gospel basically says, with God, you will avoid suffering. That's completely wrong. And nothing in the New Testament says that. With God, you will endure suffering. Jesus died so we could make our suffering like his. What does that mean? Jesus, Christianity is designed to give you a greater capacity to endure suffering. And this is how it's different from, let's say, Buddhism. Buddhism, classical Buddhism would say, well, life is suffering. And the way to avoid suffering is to avoid attachment. And so if you stay unattached, you will, you will avoid suffering. C.S. Lewis goes into this and says, yeah, if you want to preserve your heart, put it in a box, but you're also not going to love. Christianity goes into suffering. And this is why Christian missionary doctors go to, go to medical school and then go overseas and earn no money. You know, Nicholas, read Nicholas Kristof's um, series that he wrote a while ago where now let's watch the left and the right thing here, where he went into Africa and he realized it's all these Christian doctors working for nothing. Why are these missionaries doing this? Because Christians, in a sense, turn toward suffering and are not afraid of it. And this is because Jesus comes into this world of suffering. Now, you don't do so as a masochist. Um, you know, suffering is not good. And, and so you ought not to seek suffering, but you ought not to let it, Christianity, this is so complicated to talk about, Christianity is designed to give you a capacity for suffering. And, and in so many relationships, and again, if you, I love in 12 Rules for Life how Peterson talks about all the different ways that couples avoid the real suffering that it takes to get through the dysfunction and to make the marriage work. 
Well, Christianity is designed to help you face and endure suffering. Not because suffering is good, but because those who have suffered can become great. And when I say it that way, suddenly you're hearing the hero story. So where do you find God? At the end of your rope, or at the end of your power, or at the end of your resources, or at the end of, of your ability to manage complexity or to manage this world. Were Moses and Jesus weak? Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, goes up into the top of the mountain and in a sense gives the new law. But now, was Moses weak? <laughs> Moses was not weak. And, and in fact, if you look at the story of Moses, Moses again gets put into the basket, picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, educated in the best you know, in, in the best way that an Egyptian could imagine being educated in the court of Pharaoh as one of the Pharaoh's own family. But then what does Moses do? Moses is going to be a liberator. He's all about this. And he sees he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and it's like, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna be on my people. And he kills the Egyptian and he covers him up and he thinks he gets away with it. And another Egyptian comes up to him and says, I know what you did. And he runs into the desert. And he lives in the desert. Well, you don't live in the desert being being weak. Weak is not meek in the Bible. Weak and uh, meek is not mild. And so Moses goes into the desert, and then Moses finds a wife. Again, the hero's journey. You can interpret all of this within these things. It's going to be fun when Peterson gets to Exodus. I'm really looking forward to it because the stories in Exodus are just as archetypal as the stories in Genesis. So um, these are good things. But then, you know, Moses is not mild. Moses comes down from Sinai with the tablets, and what does he find? They've made golden calves because Aaron got nervous. Now who's weak? Aaron is weak. Aaron couldn't hold the line. Moses was gone for a while. The people get restless, and Aaron's like, I'm afraid of the people. Moses comes down from the mountain. Moses just seeing God. He isn't afraid of anybody. So then Moses comes down. Moses saw that the people were running wild and Aaron had let them get out of control. Aaron is weak. And so became a laughingstock to their enemies. Reputation of Israel amidst the nations is a big theme in the Old Testament. So he stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. They're his tribe. Then he, ca then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. Each man strap a sword on his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. And now these are exactly the passages in the Old Testament that a lot of skeptics say, Aha, see, God is immoral. Well, you can't both say that and say, Moses is a wimp. Moses is no wimp. Moses is a hero. He comes down, he knows the right, and, and this killing is, is anti-tribal. They're killing their own. Why? Well, this is, becomes the definition in the Old Testament of zeal. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and, and, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he blesses you on this day. Now, people will sometimes come to me and say, well, why does Jesus say, unless you hate your father and your mother and your brother and your sister, why does Jesus say that? Well, quite frankly, he's riffing on this. And he, he's getting into this theme of solely devoted to God. Now, that, that theme is within a bunch of other themes, and you have to understand it within a hierarchy, okay? So, so not to... Because you can you can you can make that idolatrous as well. So, but but this is where it comes from, where the Levites they know what's right, and they're going to make the most painful type of sacrifice. They're going to go against their instinctual tribalism, and they're actually going to kill their friends and their neighbors and their own families for the sake of the Lord. Now, I, this is going to be controversial. I understand. But here it is. But hear me out to the end of this story. The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. For now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will make atonement for your sin. Okay. Now we're seeing Jesus and Moses together. So on one hand, Moses comes down from the camp, comes down from the mountain, and in a sense represents God. And says, I am going to deal out punishment for your sins. But now naturally... Moses might be full of self-righteousness. 
and he might he might say, oh, it's all those bad people, and the bad people deserve to die. I and my Levites are the good people. He doesn't do that, because actually, that's not manly either. What does it mean to be a hero? What does it mean to be a man? Now, I'm not saying it, women shouldn't be this way too. I'm just, we're talking about, you know, men and models here. And, and whether, remember, Moses is called meek. This is meekness, okay? So Moses went back to the Lord. Now, when Moses went back to the Lord, he could very well have said, you know, Lord, it's not my fault. I was up here. It was Aaron. And, and he could have said like Adam, it was that Aaron that you gave me back when I said I didn't want this job and I said I couldn't talk. You said, get Aaron. It was that Aaron that you gave me. Moses doesn't do that. Moses says, I take the hit. That's what it means. In the camp he was fighting, when he comes up to the Lord, he takes responsibility for the people. This is how Moses and Jesus are both meek. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. When you see Jesus on the cross, you should think of Moses. Jesus is disputing with the religious authorities of his day. And Jesus says to them, they said, you know, we've got Moses. And Jesus says, if you knew Moses, you would recognize me. Well, what does he mean? It's right here. This past Sunday, I preached a sermon. You can find it on the church website. You can find it on my playlist on this. Um, you can find it on my playlist here in terms of my, it was rough draft for Sunday, and then also the, the recording of the sermon. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, you know, Moses, <laughs> Moses was a pre-echo of me. Because this is what it means to be meek. It means you stand up. You're not afraid of anyone, but when you need to submit, you submit. That's what it means to be meek. Moses says, I will take the hit for my people. Jesus on the cross says, I will take the hit for the world. That's what it means to be a man, and that's what it means to be meek. Jesus is the new Moses. John the Bath. Baptist expected that Jesus would do like Moses and slaughter the wobbly, slaughter the immoral, slaughter those, those who weren't down with the culture war project. Jesus was courageous. He didn't back down from anyone, but he feared the Lord. And if you read in the Gospel of John, he's always submitting to the Father. He didn't suck up to Herod or Pilate. And, and when he's tried, he says nothing to Herod. Herod wants to see him do tricks. Jesus just stands there, and Herod's like, I ain't going to wait for this guy. Get him out of here. And he goes to Pilate, and Pilate's like, why aren't you beggaring and whimpering? I can save your life. And Jesus says, you don't have anything, any control over me. If I wanted to summon angels and take all of y'all out, I could do so. And I'm sure when Pilate heard that, he thought, shoot, this guy's nuts. But this is the point. When Jesus then goes to the other mountain, which is Golgotha, he does like Moses does and goes up, but instead of just offering it to God and God doesn't take him up on it, when Jesus goes up to the mountain, God says, yes, you will die in place of the people. Now watch the disciples in the gospel. They're clueless. Um, that is, Jesus often gets frustrated and angry with them. Oh, you of little faith, how long do I have to put up with you? But when Jesus is arrested in the garden, First, the disciples try violence. You know, Peter takes a sword and cuts off the ear of the high, of the high priest's servant. And what does Jesus do? Jesus takes the ear and reattaches it. And Peter's like, I, 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 I want to fight a revolution. And Jesus said, if anybody's blood's going to be shed, it's going to be mine. That's the mission he's on. Is that meek? No, it's a certain kind of strength. Well, what meek will inherit the earth? Well, it's complicated in the whole picture. 
and and simply by if you take if you misdefine meekness you take away the complexity and the beauty of the story and the beauty of the beatitude and exactly what Jesus is setting up here and then you have the question which requires more strength and then again this is where Peterson is half right on the meek thing which requires more strength to to have the capacity to destroy your adversary or out of love to withhold destruction from your adversary for their sake. And that is called love. And this is the difference between a parent, you have a parent, an adult human being, and a little infant or a two-year-old. The two-year-old makes the parent angry. What does the parent do? Does the parent get angry? Yeah, you probably get angry. What do you do with your anger? Do you get violent with the child? Well, when the parent gives the spanking and says, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, it's because it's harder for the parent to withhold the power they have for the well-being of the child. And again, if you read Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, this is all in alignment with that too. But then we find Peter in the book of Acts. Peter has been changed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Peter then filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account, now Peter's on trial. Before he was afraid, he gets, he, 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 he crumbles under the questions of a servant girl. Low status, and this is about as low status you can get, a servant girl. He crumbles under that question. But now, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter's a different man. If we are being called to account today for acts of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how was he healed, then you know this, you and all your people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Peter is bold. He used to be scared. Now he's bold. Why? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Well, why'd they take note? Because before, the, 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 the enemies of Jesus said, if we get rid of Jesus, his disciples will scatter. We can see what kind of people they are. Well, they killed Jesus, and new Jesus has arrived. And it's Peter and John, and it stands before them. And they're not running away. And they know very well they could be killed. And they're so bold, the religious leaders fall back. And if you read the Gospel of John, this is exactly happened when Jesus says, I am he, and everyone falls on the ground in the Gospel of John. Well, this is like Jesus was. They're like Jesus. They're meek in all the right ways, but they're strong. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Well, now who's weak? So they offered them to withdraw, so they offered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have produced performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thinking from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. And do they do that? No. And they tell them, Are we going to do this? No. You can put me in prison. You can kill me. And James, Peter, James, and John, James will be one of the first ones to go. He'll be killed in the persecution. Why? For this kind of thing. They are meek, but they are not mild. They are meek, but they are not weak. Meekness, so again, this isn't the definition of the word. That's what bothers me. Exegetically, it's wrong. But if you understand it in the total picture, that's right. That's the point. This is what real strength is. Roman Catholic nature and grace. Natural law says that there is a structure to reality built in by its creator. Some of you are given strength. Strength is a good thing. In nature, the strong take the weak. Now, what happens in grace? So, so and this is how it becomes a both and. If you're strong, what should do you do with your strength? 
Well, what should you do with your strength? You should do as the one who gave you the strength what he gave you the strength for. Now, if you're weak, and some people are just weak, the Greeks knew this, we've all known this, some people are, and I don't mean mentally weak, I mean physically weak. Your body is not healthy. You're physically not very strong, or maybe politically weak. You have no power, or maybe economically weak. You have no money. What are you to do? Are you to rise up? Or how are you to work this matrix? One of my favorite movies is by Steve Martin, and, and I've been watching some, uh, what's his name? Wait, Russell Brand. I've been some, watching around some of Russell Brand's interviews. And one of the things I, I, I think comedians, and if you're going to be a great comedian, you have to be an astute observer of humanity. And Steve Martin was, I think, is such a person. And, and actually, Steve Martin has an audible, an autobiography, which is a terrific little book, which is worth reading. And, and I often appreciate Steve Martin's movies because he is seeing into things. And one of my favorite Steve Martin's movies is Leap of Faith. And I want to play you a little clip for it. And in, in this movie, Steve Martin is a lying pastor, as an archetypally lying pastor. He's a, he's a fraudulent revival minister who is fleecing dupes and idiots and rubes and any other... Any other nasty name you can give him for the kind of people who fall for the religious con. But what happens, in, he's, he rolls into a town, and of course he gets an eye for the pretty girl, and he you know, wants to get her in bed. And, um, but there's this, there's, this, there's this boy who comes up, and, um, and oh my goodness, the boy is actually healed in his, his fake healing ministry. The boy actually is healed, and this undoes Steve Martin. Oh no, where's my, did I put the wrong order? Oh no, oh okay, I know what I did wrong. Oh, back. I'm giving away my, I'm giving away my, my big ending. Well, let's watch the video. Can't see, it's kind of, kind of dark. He's alone in his tent church. And he's rather unprotestant because he's got a, a Jesus up on the cross. Hey, boss. Remember me? Jack Newton. I've got a question for you. Why'd you make so many suckers? shall inherit the earth, and I say the only thing the meat can count on is getting the short end of the stick. You say, is there one among you who is pure of heart? And I say, not one! Yes. Hello, Boyd. Why aren't you out signing autographs or dancing? I need to ask you a question. Um... I wanted to know when you plan to leave town. Leave? A couple of days, I guess. Well, I, I wanted to know if I could go with you. Well... I can do a lot of things. I'll earn my keep. You're a little too old to be running away with the circus, aren't you, kid? No, it, it's not that. Like... You made me walk again, okay? A lot of people tried to do that, but they couldn't. Hold it, kid. I had nothing to do with you walking. Sure you did. Everybody saw it. Look, I run a show here. It's a lot of smoke and noise, and it's strictly for the suckers. I've been pulling one kind of scam or another since I was your age. And if there's one thing I know, it's how to spot the genuine article. Because that's what you got to watch out for. Not the cops. You can always get around the cops. But the one thing you can never, ever get around is the genuine article. And you, kid, are the genuine article. Are you saying you think you're a fake? I know I'm a fake. 
Well, what difference does it make if you get the job done? Kid, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. It does. It really does. I, this movie gets me. It gets me every time. <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. Andy Crouch has a great little book, um, Playing God, Redeeming the Gift of Power. And he gets into this. There, There is, I should add at the outset, one group of people who talk almost um, about almost nothing but power. The academic world, especially the humanities, have been shaped in the last generation by a new attention to the power dynamics at work in human lives and institutions. Influenced recently by Michel Foucault and perhaps most deeply by Friedrich Nietzsche, Whole disciplines have reoriented themselves around excavating the hidden power lines in human endeavors. I, I agree with the Foucaultians that power is everywhere, but in this book I am going to offer the outlines of a different way of seeing this reality. Underlying much of the academic fascination with power, it seems to me, is the preposition, is the presupposition that power is essentially coercive. That even when power looks life-giving and creative, it actually cloaks a violent fist in a creative glove. I believe this is exactly backwards. I actually believe the deepest form of power is creation, and that when power takes the form of coercion and violence, that is actually a diminishment and distortion of what it was meant to be. Indeed, instead of creation being merely well-conceived coercion, Violence is best seen as the result of misplaced and misdirected creation. Why is power a gift? Because power is for flourishing. When power is used well, people in the whole cosmos come most alive to what they were meant to be. Flourishing is the test of power. Writing a book is an act of creative power with all the risks and uncertainties that come with any true act of creation. Reading a book is its own exercise of creative power, one that requires the investment and risk of time, attention, hope, and a kind of love. I am grateful that you've taken up this book. I pray that when you put it down, you will be one step closer to the flourishing for which you were created, and that as we together make something of the world, the cosmos itself would groan a bit less and sing a bit more as the whole creation awaits the revealing of the children of God. And that is Andy Crouch quoting from Romans 8. And this is the point. What does it mean to be meek? It means to understand what power is and, and to understand that life is lived beneath the one greatest power that brought all of this into being and to live in accordance with this and to live in submission to that. And, and it's because of your submission to that that sometimes you do this. But figuring this out is really difficult. Viktor Frankl, The End of Your Rope, Misery. What do you, um, what do you use you? What did I think when I was writing that? I don't remember. It was just this morning. Viktor Frankl, the famous psychologist, went through Auschwitz, the horrific German concentration camp, a place of torture, suffering, and death for more than a million helpless people. They were anawim. They were meek. They had no options. But they always had an option. He said, they took my clothes, my wife, my kids, my wedding ring. I stood naked before the SS, and I realized that they can take everything in my life, but they cannot take my freedom to choose how I respond to them. Dr. King, look at Dr. King. Now, I get, I'm an, I'm an old school, <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the mother's milk I was raised on. And when I look at the so-called liberation movements today, I look at them and I say they have lost their roots. They have no discipline. They have no organization. They don't even have a clear goal. They're just out there wanting to tear something down. It is mindless chaos compared to Dr. King. Look at what Dr. King says after they bombed his house. Look, read the history of the civil rights movement and pay attention to the different camps within it and how they struggled and why we venerate Dr. King the way we do. If you have weapons, take them home. If you do not have them, please do not seek to get them. 
We cannot solve this problem through retaliatory violence. We must meet violence with nonviolence. And if you think violence is hard, nonviolence is harder because it's more costly because you absorb the hit and you still don't hate. That is power. Remember the words of Jesus, who who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. We must love our white brothers no matter what they do to us. We must make them know that we love them. Jesus still cries out in words that echo across the centuries. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that, dis that, that despitefully use you. This is what we must live by. We must, we must meet hate with love. Remember, if I am stopped, this movement will not stop because God is in the movement. Go home with this glowing faith and his radiant assurance. King's words after a bomb was thrown into his house in Alabama, 30 January 1956, in Stride Towards Freedom, 1968. Misery, Deliverance, Gratitude. The Imitation of Christ. Peterson talks about the imitation of Christ. Well, how do we imitate him? The mockers at the cross say to him, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And what we don't see is that he was saving others by not saving himself. And this is the definition of the meek inheriting the earth. And, and now how do you figure that out? Does it mean you're a doormat? No, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you're a doormat. It does mean that sometimes you submit. It sometimes means sometimes you stand up, but because you have no power, you're crushed. And this is why Dr. King and, and everyone, they took the blows. They took the fire hoses. They didn't find weapons and fight back. They took the pain. They took the hit. The meek inherit the earth. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's in a sense... Rocky won, which was the only good of the Rocky movies. Jim Elliott, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The age of decay will take us all. You know, I used to have hair. Um, I've still got health and strength. Uh, someday I won't have those things. But he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliott was a young missionary who was killed trying to reach a tribe of Indians in the Amazon. And his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, went on to write some really remarkable Christian books, really honest Christian books. And if you want to find a woman preacher who does not lie, read Elizabeth Elliott. Every archetypal, self-sacrificial hero in any good story has known this. This is the story. This is what it means to be a hero. This is the story of Christ. And we see this story again and again and again and again in the stories. And even Steve Martin in this film, he's one of these anti-heroes who's a fraud, but he knows he's a fraud. And then at the end of it, watch the movie. I'll just finish by reading the Beatitudes. You got a, 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 a proof text without a context is a pretext. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is where resurrection comes into the picture, because I will say these things and people will say back to me, yeah, but I, I've tried that and it doesn't work. Well, the crucifixion makes no sense in this light without the resurrection. And then people say to me, well, well, Jesus could only go to the crucifixion because he knew he would be raised. And I say, exactly. Do you know you will be raised? And what does that mean? 
and 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 I think it means you'll be raised in every way that you can be raised and you will be raised to a glory that that you that you can hardly know now one that you can hardly imagine that's the resurrection so every time I hear Jordan Peterson talk about the meek I get a little annoyed and um, because exegetically I don't know where he gets this interpretation but it's all wet but the bigger point is not all wet. So if you're going to ask me about what is what how, that thing about Jordan Peterson and the meek, is that true? Here's my answer.